Welcome everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes. We're just gonna make sure everyone can get in from the waiting room. We have a nice size group joining us today. All right, to those who are just joining, we're waiting for everybody to come in from the waiting room. It looks like things are slowing down, so we will get started. So welcome everyone. I am Allison Rich. I am the president of the Sports Lawyers Association, and we are thrilled to have you join us here today. Uh, this is our uh, Time for Nine panel, Title IX, NIL, and other hot topics in college sports. This is obviously a topic near and dear to my heart and to everyone, and we're really excited for our fantastic panelists to, to talk with you today. As I noted, this is part of our Time for Nine series, which is our celebration as a Sports Lawyers Association of 50 years of Title IX. The anniversary is in June, and we've been running a series of programming since the fall, and we'll go all the way through until the actual anniversary date and beyond um, with panels on inf with information and conversation and thoughts about where we can go from here with Title IX after the 50 years. So thank you for joining us today. If you're interested in any of the previous panels or, or um, programming, it's all available on our website, sportslaw.org, and also on our YouTube channel. So please look for that. So that and many other benefits are what comes to you when you're an SLA member. And thank you to those of you who are with us today who are members. Hopefully you are current, you rejoined. Um, those who aren't, we hope that you'll take a look at, at our offerings and, and think about joining the organization. It's the preeminent sports law organization in the world. And we try to provide as much wonderful programming and benefits as possible. So if you have any questions, let us know, but please take a look on uh, sportslaw.org and uh, we hope you will join us. And the important part about joining now is the timing because we are going to be back in person together for our annual conference this May. And there's a good rate for the members. So please do join us. Um, our annual conference is in Atlanta this May, May 12th through 14th. We are thrilled to be back in person. It is going to be an amazing conference. There's gonna be some, some spectacular speakers and panels. Uh, and there's a uh, it's a th our theme is uh, sports as a platform to elevate inclusion. So we've got all kinds of great information for you if you'll join us there at the at the conference in Atlanta. Uh, Melissa has posted in the chat the link to join uh, the conference or to register for the conference. So please take a look at that as you have time as well. With that, thank you again for joining us today. This is going to be a fantastic panel. I'm really excited to hear all the great things that are going to come out. So I will turn things over to Tim as our, our host and moderator uh, to get things started. Thanks again and welcome. Great, thanks Allison. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm very excited to be hosting and moderating this panel of esteemed individuals who I've had a chance to work with and speak with in the past and I consider friends and colleagues. Um, they will provide some insights and expertise related to our topic today of college sports. Uh, and in particular, uh, name, image, and likeness and other hot topics. So to begin, um, also, I'm, my name is Tim Nevius. I'm a sports attorney. I'm an SLA member, as well as a, a member of the Time for Nine SLA committee. And um, I'm excited to be joined today. I'll just do some introductions and then we'll get into some of the questions. Uh, Congresswoman Lori Trahan. She is the first in her family to graduate from college after earning a volleyball scholarship from Georgetown where she graduated from the prestigious Walsh School of Foreign Service. She served for Congressman Marty Meehan's staff as chief of staff before serving in, uh, moving into the private sector where she was the only female executive at a tech company and co-founded a women-owned and operated consulting firm. In 2018, she was elected as a member of Congress where she represents the people of Massachusetts third district. During her time in Congress, she's co-sponsored two bills related to college athletes, including the College Athlete Economic Freedom Act, which would provide college athletes with broad NIL rights, and the College Athlete Right to Organize Act, which would amend the NLR NLRA to deem college athletes as employees in, at, in public, at public colleges as employees in this college sports context, as well as allow for collective bargaining rights. Congresswoman Trahan, welcome. Thank you for having me, Tim. Absolutely. Jill Bodensteiner, she is the athletics director at St. Joseph's University in her fourth year. She joined the Hawks after a 20-year career at alma mater, University of Notre Dame. 
She spent 10 years as an attorney in the office of general counsel there and moved into Notre Dame Athletics in July 20, 2009, where she was responsible for compliance, governance, legal issues, among other things. As she was also the sport administrator for women's basketball, which reached six Final Fours in her nine years with the program, and she served on a variety of um, committees within the NCAA, including the NCAA's uh, working group on name, image, and likeness. Jill, welcome. Thanks, Tim. I'm uh, really flattered and honored to be with this esteemed group, so thank you. Absolutely. And Jayla Tolbert. Jayla is a brand strategist with Student Athlete NIL, which she'll tell us about. She previously worked with Octagon Sports and is a former volleyball athlete at Virginia Tech, where she earned both all-conference honors in both athletics and academics. She graduated with a BA in International Studies with a concentration in business and Chinese. Very impressive, Jayla. And she served on the NCAA's Division I uh, and Atlantic Coast Conference Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Hey, Jayla, welcome. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the intro. I'm very happy to be here. Great. Great to have you all. What I want to do is just start with, and, and I'd like to make this as discussion oriented as possible. So feel free to talk amongst each other. We we'll welcome questions from the audience as well. Um, and we don't have to follow a script. We have, so I'll, I'll be here to moderate and guide us, but um, please take it and run with it um, as we get into the topics. To start, we're obviously celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And what I'd like to do is just start with, with each of you, Congresswoman Trahan, um, starting with you, just reflecting on what that means to you in terms of Title IX, what it's meant to you in your life and your career, um, and particularly as it touches on your, your time as an athlete. Uh, well, thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me and thanks for putting together such a great uh, panel. Uh, certainly, you know, Title IX gave me the opportunity to change my life. Uh, getting a volleyball scholarship to go to Georgetown uh, certainly changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, I was the first person in my family, like you said, to graduate from college, and that would not have happened at a, you know, a university like Georgetown if not for the opportunity to play sports. Uh, and, um, and so, look, I think it's, it's offered an amazing opportunity uh, to a lot of women. Uh, but to say that the work is done, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today uh, is the work that remains. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited to be in Congress today so that I can help spearhead some of that work. Uh, the inequities that are in place and that we've seen, you know, I had Sedona uh, Prince on my panel uh, last week and that video that just went viral because everyone else in the world understands that the inequities exist, but boy, showing it um, in a way that people can just immediately understand, uh, it leaves a lot for us to uh, think through in terms of how far we have come in these 50 years. So uh, it's great to um, you know, see athletes like Jayla, who's leaning in uh, because we are absolutely going to need uh, the next generation to finish the work uh, that so many before us have started. It, it's a great point in terms of, you know, we've talked about it a lot in terms of both the celebration aspect as well as the challenges. And I think it's important it'll come up in, in some of the topics we're talking about today. Jill, uh, on that note, can you provide some reflections and what Title IX has meant to you and your, your career? Yeah, so Title IX's had a great impact both personally and professionally. So I, um, you know, I was a very shy, extremely introverted child and basketball gave me my voice and my confidence and to have those opportunities to play high school basketball in the great state of Indiana. And um, really for me, it was a game changer. I was, uh, you know, named captain my senior year. I was a good solid player and it, uh, it really gave me my voice and um, my place and my identity. So I'm extraordinarily thankful to, to what Title IX did for me. I'm, I'm a daughter of a civil rights lawyer. And so I grew up doing my eighth grade project on Title IX. And, um, you know, professionally, I was in-house counsel at Notre Dame and had a higher ed practice right after Davis and Gebser. So I was, you know, defending the university on early rounds of sexual misconduct under Title IX. Uh, we did an extraordinarily comprehensive Title IX review at Notre Dame that resulted in, um, you know, really, really 
the great changes. Uh, I remember when the EEOC came out with its 1997 pay guidance, um, which really, you know, really shed the light on the inequities in pay in college athletics. So uh, professionally, I've always just been really, really um, into and attracted to the issues under Title IX. I, I join uh, Congresswoman Trahan in saying, boy, what great progress we've made, and my goodness, what a long way, way to go. Um, so that, that's just a little of my involvement over the years. Thanks, Jill, that's great. Jayla, how about you? I, I won't be able to go in as depth um, with the wins that my other counterparts here have, but, um, you know, obviously, like they've said, Title IX gave me the opportunity to play in my sport at the highest level, um, gave me a voice, and it made me more aware of my surroundings and, and the issues that we face. Um, but through that voice, being a leader on SAC and being able to enact change um, from the top level, that, that's what I'm most appreciative of. Great. Thanks, Jayla. So let's with with that now let's um talk about our our main topic here which is is name hot topics in college sports but we're going to start with name image and likeness which is arguably or indisputably the hottest topic right now um each of these panelists have direct experience with name image and likeness both in, in terms of the topic and the regulations surrounding them um, but I want to start with Congresswoman Trahan in terms of just your impressions so far I mean you've been a leader on this topic in particular in proposing a, a, a bill, even uh, co-sponsoring that bill at the federal level, um, your impressions so far and, and what your takeaways are. Yeah, so I jumped feet first into this bill because it's, uh, it's personal to me. So much of my lived experience uh, is uh, around my ability to go to Georgetown on a volleyball scholarship. Um, and college ath athletes sacrificed so much of their time and their opportunity to play competitively while balancing um, that commitment with school. Uh, I often use the example that when I played volleyball at Georgetown, I couldn't even coach a summer camp for high school girls back home because, you know, according to the NCAA, it jeopardized my amateur status. And it was ridiculous back then. Uh, it's even more ridiculous today. Uh, and that is why I'm so passionate about college athletes' rights, whether that's to be compensated for name, image, and likeness, uh, or the right to stand up for themselves by organizing and you know, negotiating the comp safety and, and playing conditions that they deserve. In terms of my um, impressions, it has been really exciting to see young athletes become entrepreneurs overnight. Uh, as I mentioned, I hosted a panel last week with Sedona Prince and Sydney Moore, two young women who are now able to receive compensation from everything from mentoring other young women athletes to, to brand promote promotions for uh, you know, businesses they believe in. And you know, for those of us paying close attention to this issue, the number of deals that women college athletes have announced in recent months has been remarkable. Uh, even for those of us who were confident that women would thrive in an NIL market. Uh, we've been saying all along that the value college athletes bring to their schools and to their sports go far beyond the cost of a scholarship. And the booming number of NIL deals, large and small across all the sports continues proving that to be true. Um, but, you know, look, we, it, I think we've seen um, the critics argument that, you know, women would not fare as well as men in the NIL, in the NIL market. Um, thrown out the window. Uh, but beyond that, we know, you know, universities and conferences don't place uh, as much effort on advertising and promoting women's sports. I mean, anyone who attended a school at a D1 basketball or football program, they'll, they'll tell you that much. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that, you know, NIL has incredible benefits for women athletes themselves and, and the sports that they play. But it's, but it's also invaluable for the next generation of athletes, young girls like my two daughters who are seeing women athletes as leaders in their, in their sport and who they can look up to. So my hope is that we see even more engagement uh, and promotion of the women's uh, you know, basketball tour tournament or softball tourney uh, than, than we did even you know, this record breaking year. Great, thank you. And you know, I may come back and just talk about um, federal legislation and you know the, the discussion about the the, the need or um, not for a federal federal bill oh. to apply uniformly. Um, 
but but Jill, I want to talk to you just uh, from an athletic director's perspective. Then, what are your impressions so far of name, image, and likeness? And are there particular things with respect to, you know, there's there's some positive outcomes with respect to women involved in name, image, and likeness. Are there things also that we should be concerned about uh, with respect to gender equity in this topic? Yeah, th thanks, Tim. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go a little bit backwards here. Jayla and I both had the opportunity to serve on the NCA NIL committee, so I want to just sort of set some context there. Um, and, and I also want to preview this by saying I am not a sky is falling kind of AD. I support change. We need change. You know, I'm an institution sitting in the Third Circuit. I'm preparing to pay minimum wage and overtime if that's what the Third Circuit says we need to do. Um, you know, did sports betting ruin sports? Remember when we all thought that? Like, no, like it has it. Did NIL ruin it? To the contrary, I'm a huge fan of what it's doing for our student athletes. So um, I hope you take my comments as uh, as they're intended, which is just the reality of the situation and not, not whining. Um, but the reality of the situation is college athletics, like all other sports, are at their very nature about competition. And so the tension in all sports at every level comes when you try and level the playing field, which inevitably comes with restraints, which inevitably um, brings up conversations of antitrust. And so, you know, at the pro level, we see all sorts of player restraints and all sorts of antitrust exemptions. And, um, and, and so, you know, from a committee perspective, we went into to this thinking, you know, how could NIL exist in a, uh, in a way that benefits student athletes greatly, but we had really two caveats. One, um, are we gonna throw leveling the playing field out the window? Um, and that's happened, right? We, right now we have two levels of NIL. One is legitimate and one is made up. And so one is legitimately based on the market of the athletes and the other called collectives is just a made up way <laughs> to get student athletes to come or stay at your institution. And so as a committee, we thought about that second level, you know, I'm all for a free market and paid what you're worth and, and getting women more opportunities. But I think we all have to admit that with the rise of collectives, that's not a legitimate NIL market. So let's let's just hold on to that for a minute here. Um, we, we have a men's basketball training transfer athlete who's going to come visit us. And then he just called yesterday to say, I just got 750 in Alexis, 750K in Alexis. So peace out little St. Joe's in the A-10. Um, we are never going to be in that league. So I, it, we just need to be comfortable with the fact that we have two very, very different systems of NIL going on here. So, um, you know, that, that first market uh, the legitimate one with open doors and sponsorships and autographs and lessons, I think stands to benefit women greatly. The second level where collectives full of alumni who are paying to attract and retain athletes is going to become sexist. And it already is. Um, you know, that's seen as I'll give you 750K if you come to my institution. Uh, I'll give you X if you stay at my institution. I think that's where the gender equity concerns are going to come. Um, and those are difficult because, right, those collectives aren't governed by Title IX, but what's the institutional role? Like as a federal funded institution, like we all are, but for I think three colleges or universities in the country, um, you know, that this whole, does Title IX apply to the collectives? Well, what happens when I get the phone call from my alums saying we're, we're creating a collective? Do I say, don't talk to me because if I talk to you, I'm on the hook for Title IX and let them do what they want. What if it violates compliance rules, Pennsylvania state law? So I feel like I should be talking to those alums about how to create a good collective. But if I become involved, now we're now we have Title IX implications, which I ultimately cannot control. So from an athletic director's seat, the second market, which has become 100 percent, let's not make any mistake about it, recruiting and retention. Um, it has no control and makes me very, very, very nervous. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'd be remiss and I promise I'll be quiet and move on if I didn't mention the fact that, um, you know, when it comes to antitrust, one of the most interesting things to me is how we got in this situation, which is in large part because the NBA and the NFL have antitrust exemptions that allow them to freeze out players and make them go to college. And so, and that's because of the greed of the owners. And so what we are is we're in a position where they have to come to college. Nobody talks about exploiting hockey or baseball student athletes because they have a legitimate choice. If they wanna go pro and make money, they can go pro. 
but the collective bargaining agreements of the NFL and NBA have said, you have to go to college, even if you don't want to. Um, and that's put us in this position. And then they have the luxury of saying, we have a draft and other player restraints. We don't have a draft. It is wide open, free choice. And now we are ironically the uh, forum for college sports that has no restraints on drafting. It's a wide open market and no restraints on NIL. And so we have created ourselves um, a situation where you can just buy players and that's disconcerting to someone like me who's at a mid-major and will never afford to buy those players, whether it's the institution paying uh, the collective or a legitimate third party. Um, so anyway, that's, that's where I am. Again, I love NIL, I love the opportunities, but I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that people aren't just buying players. Yeah, clear concerns there that are that are, are shared across uh, the country from a, a number of people, and we're going to see how this unfolds. Jayla, you, you served with Jill on that NCAA NIL committee, and I know you all talked about how to, you know, restrict the or you know set appropriate rules to account for some of the issues that Jill's talking about. Since then, you're you've worked as a brand strategist now, and you've actually helped with some of the marketing with respect to athletes, with respect to brands and other of these third parties. What's your perspective um, with that as a background? Yeah, so the way female student athletes are leveraging NIL has been so interesting and different across the board. I think we mentioned it. I mean, modeling contracts, sponsorships, content creation, coaching clinics, um, philanthropic efforts. There's so much range that they have to maximize their opportunity. And as grassroots marketers, female student athletes can and like are the perfect, perfect position to, to leverage their platform. So from, I guess, the brand side, being able to articulate your point of view and tell your story or I guess a brand story in an engaging way it breeds good marketing. And I feel like time and time again, female student athletes are just the best at it. And it's because a lot of them tend to have a natural eye. Um, but then they also just have this drive that you really can't teach. So it's been amazing just to see the growth in the space. Um, and I'm really excited for where female student athletes in particular are headed. Yeah, I, I think we've seen definitely some some incredible opportunities and deals that women have the opportunity to take advantage of. Um, they've been highlighted in a very positive manner. I think it's shown that the market for, um, for the marketing in the name, image, and likeness of women is perhaps greater than people even estimated, which is terrific. Now it's a matter of providing them with the right support um, and opportunities and encouraging that. Jill, I, Congresswoman Trahan, I, I, want to, I want to talk about the issues that Jill raised before doing that, I want to I want to read this um, letter from the Office of the Civil Rights that speaks to how institutions engage with third parties that may apply in the scenario in which Jill you're speaking to. Um, in, in this letter from 2017, which was with respect to the historic basketball league, if you recall that the the um, the opportunity to create uh, a men's league that was outside of the institution, but nevertheless provided for payment and education at uh, HBCUs for, for those athletes. It hasn't come to fruition yet, but there was a letter sent to the OCR seeking guidance on a similar point related to outside third parties that I think is instructive for this conversation and may come up in, in the near future. Um, the quoting from the letter, it states that a, a recipient institution, meaning a federal, federally funded, may violate Title IX when it assists an outside organization that engages in sex discrimination, meaning Title IX can apply here with, with these third parties, depending on the connection with the university, as Jill, you alluded to. As part of its broad prohibition on sex discrimination, the Title IX regulations prohibit recipients from aiding or perpetuating perpetuating discrimination by providing significant assistance to any outside organization that discriminates on the basis of sex and providing any aid, benefit, or service to students or employees. So I think that's significant, and it may come up in, in the near future. Congresswoman Trahan, though, in terms of, you know, how to look at this, the balance of what the, the market is, is doing with respect to the concerns then that Jill has raised, how do you see this? 
Well, I think uh, Jill laid it out perfectly in terms of you know the two different uh, the two different markets. On the one hand, we are uh, we are seeing uh, unbelievable opportunity, which look we didn't know was going to happen. I mean, one of the reasons why I worked with uh, Senator Murphy so closely was so that we had language um, in the NIL bill to ensure that we were capturing the lessons uh, of how women were going to get impacted um, because we didn't know that some of the, the, the largest basketball deals, for example, were going to be um, from women. You know, separately, we are hearing more and more about uh, NIL collectives, uh, which are becoming a way um, that colleges can have a hand in college athletes getting compensated for their name, image, and likeness. and, uh, and you know, it's interesting to hear Jill talk because my starting position was I think support in general is helpful, especially when it comes to educating athletes on these deals that they're being offered, you know, their tax liabilities and other important issues. You know, what I do have concerns about uh, in terms of NIL collectives playing a role in recruitment and inducements and, and how like we've always seen with the risk in college sports that the athletes are the ones who will pay a heavy price if you know the NCAA decides to crack down. And everyone knows, you know, boosters have always helped universities bring in money for athletics, but there have always been strict firewalls on boosters being used during recruitment. Um, and this needs to extend, I think, to NIL collectives. Uh, additionally, if universities are going uh, to proactively help athletes get access to NIL deals, then I think it's, you know, there's a tension there that Jill, you know, uh, uh, talked about. Um, they have to help all athletes equally. Um, and Title IX does take effect. And that most certainly includes, you know, helping women athletes. So uh, I am, I'm proud of the legislation that Senator Murphy and I introduced, one, because it does set up a federal standard, which I'm happy to talk about more in depth, but um, there's also language regarding equitable institutional support to clarify that resources for NIL should, you know, have to continue to be distributed evenly. Uh, and on that point too, I mean, it, I think it's really important for people to understand they don't always see how um, Title IX might apply in scenarios like this. There's, you mentioned it in, in Jill too, in terms of the recruiting aspect, that there still has to be a, the, the level of resources given to the recruiting um, of college athletes has to, has to be with equity in mind. But there's also, for instance, in this context with name, image, and likeness, the approval or rejection of the use of school marks for, for certain deals, the approval or rejection of deals themselves which is part of both state laws and some school policy. The level of assistance provided in education, which Congresswoman, you referred to, um, whether it's with respect to taxes or financial education or marketing or contracts. The level of assistance in the actual publicity or marketing of the athletes themselves, um, as well as the level of assistance in, in now facilitating these name, image, and likeness deals, which is starting to cross over into you know, the, the schools are actually starting to get involved in that respect. Certain state laws have restricted that, but now states are even repealing their laws. And, and so, Jill, I, I, when you talk about those issues in particular, states are starting to repeal their laws in order to actually start helping facilitate internally from the school themselves some of these name, image, and likeness deals, which obviously then can bring up these Title IX compliance issues. Um, and I think now we're talking about what we may frame as the legitimate, perhaps, market for name, image, and likeness. But how do you navigate those issues that I just went through, and in particular, schools start to potentially start to facilitate these deals themselves? Well, it's already happening 100%. I mean, I don't care what it's, can anyone, I would love to see a, ra a hand raised if anyone knows of a state law that's been enforced to the disadvantage of a student athlete, right? There's all these laws on the books. Like who wrote the laws? The big state institutions wrote the laws, right? I, I know who wrote ours in the state of Pennsylvania. I can tell you it wasn't St. Joe's and it wasn't the, gover the government. Um, it was the schools who were saying, if I'm going to have a chance to win a national championship, state legislator, you better hook me up. And so these laws are, first of all, not being enforced by anybody. And secondly, um, 
states want their big flagship institutions to win national championships. And so if we're hoping for some sort of gender equity controls coming from the state or some sort of limits on institutional involvement coming from the states, that's not going to happen in any meaningful way. And I don't care what it says on paper. It's mm -hmm. simply not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I, I don't think collectives are bound by Title IX. And I think if anyone had statistics on collectives, I think we're gonna see that 99% of the money is going to male athletes mm -hmm. because we live in a sexist world where um, the alumni are gonna want their football teams to succeed. And they're gonna say, we're gonna throw a bone to other athletes, but this is gonna be about football and men's basketball. And it's gonna, it's a, it already is a completely unfettered recruiting device tied to no market whatsoever. And Title IX has no control over them unless I'm stupid enough to say this collective is part of St. Joseph's University, which I would never do. So I have to wash my hands of it, um, which then just puts us in this vicious circle. So I, I think I love the real market for all the reasons Jayla stated, because women are better at these things <laughs> than men are. Men wanna kick back and get paid. Women wanna engage and show their personality and they've got different things. So the real market doesn't worry me one iota because they're in it to make money. And capitalists wanna make money off the people who will make them money, which is in many cases, female athletes. Um, so I love that market. What, what we did understand and the federal government might not have, but we understood the second market was gonna come up. And that's what we were worried about. Um, and here we have it and is quite simply buying male athletes to come into state institutions. And so, um, you know, this is no surprise to any of us, but no one, you know, we were sort of our hands were tied and other people thought they knew better than we did. And here we are. And we're just buying athletes to institutions. And that's the new world we live in. And um, I don't, I, you know, I'm, it is, again, I'm not a whiner, is what it is, <laughs> but, um, but it's not, it's not a real market and we shouldn't kid ourselves. Jayla, in that respect, I'd like to you know, get your response to any of that, but also I want to show some statistics just about, um, and this is with a caveat, that this may provide some insight into the opportunities that are being presented to women's athletes, college athletes in general, but I want to focus on the statistics related to women. Um, we're not sure how accurate they are. These are statistics from Open Doors, which doesn't work with every institution, for instance, um, and it doesn't always account for the values that are assigned to whether it's merchandise or uh, longer term, whether monthly or, or annual contracts. But I'll, I'll just share my screen here to get uh, some figures, and then Jayla would ask you to respond to just um, what you're seeing developing, you know, on anything you want to respond to with respect to what Congresswoman Trahan and, and uh, Jill just mentioned, but also looking forward, the opportunities that have exist, existed for women so far and what you see developing in that respect. So let me just share my screen here real quick. And we're looking at these statistics from Open Doors which you can see on the left side is total compensation by sport. On the right side are total NIL activities. So for instance, you'll see women's basketball as right behind football in terms of the total compensation by sport. On the right side, you see women's basketball at 4% of, of total uh, NIL activities, which may be because of the number of athletes, uh, also the value per deal that the athletes may be getting. Um, and again, this is all with a grain of salt because this may provide some insight, but it's certainly not perfect. Jayla, can you talk about your impressions here and what you're seeing developed with women in the space and any other reactions you have to the conversation so far? Yeah, yeah. Um, just to quickly kind of touch on some things that Lori and Joe brought up. Again, we, we knew what the risks were when we were sitting on the committee trying to figure out what this all looked like and, and how all this comes to fruition. Um, obviously, the, the fears come true because we know that no one has control over anything. Um, but obviously, I, I love the legitimate deals that are happening that are helping brand these athletes for postgraduate opportunities. And when it comes to collectives, while many are probably under the table, a little underground and, and trying to use their power as a recruiting chip, you know, I think some of my work and what I hope, you know, even at Sunil, what we're trying to do is figure out how we can take a collective and make it professionally managed. 
make it so that the institution doesn't have to feel like they have to wash their hands of any type of wrongdoing, um, and then make it an even playing field. We've spoken to so many collectives about how they want to spend their money, and Jill's totally right. Some of them are like, well, how can we figure things out for our male athletes? And the male athletes are like, this is great. Collectives are here, you know? But our role as um, entities in this space and as leaders and, and having, again, me being a former female student athlete and working with people that understand equity and how important it is, what we're hoping to do is make sure that those collectives have a little bit of a check and are distributing money evenly across sports as much as possible. So mm -hmm. that's something that I'm personally super passionate about. And I know the people that I work with um, are also passionate about, but obviously it's kind of a who can get there first in, in this um, in this game, you know, it's all just starting and so early. So we'll see. Um, that said, in terms of all those numbers, yeah, I mean, from what I've seen in the marketplace, um, the, the sports that have been a little bit more dominant in the space, obviously we know football, basketball, um, women's basketball has been great. Women's volleyball has also put up strong numbers, but I think some of the interesting aspects of this, when I look at a gymnast gymnastics falls pretty low on that totem pole of, of how many girls are getting deals but when I look at their value the gymnasts that are getting deals are crushing it in the space so it's really really interesting to see how female athletes are kind of benchmarked right now because even though there's a ton of women's volleyball players that are using their platforms to grow their NIL and they have a ton of different deals across the board there are a lot of smaller sports that are making big bucks doing what they're doing. So I think that's some context to put behind those numbers, um, but it'll be interesting to see how it changes. Great. Tim, can, Great. I add, can I just Great. add uh, to that? Because I think, you know, one of the things that we didn't discuss at the beginning, um, you know, we, so we do have these patchwork of state laws, right? We do have that because the NCAA chose not to act um, in, uh, you know, in the time that, you know, would have us afforded, um, you know, these, uh, maybe learning these lessons a little bit faster. Um, but the reality is we are learning these lessons uh, based on, uh, you know, the, the state's actions. Um, and so I think what is really hard um, on the on the university, um, but definitely on the student athlete, it, is that there's no federal standard. Uh, you know, so in addition to like if you are a first uh, generation college athlete and you're navigating that deal uh, and maybe multiple deals just to go to a university. Those are stressful. I mean, look, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. My parents didn't know how to read the legalese as I was getting ready to sign my letter of intent. And that is the reality for so many college athletes that people don't understand, right? These are not these are not folks who come from families that have financial, uh, you know, support teams and analysts or even a lawyer, uh, a family lawyer. And so layering on the added burden of figuring out, oh, well, does this state have an NIL law and what, which version of it is, which, you know, how, how do, how, so then how do you actually give the student the tools so that they can properly evaluate, understand what they're signing um, is just, it, it just screams the need for uniformity. Uh, and that's why a federal standard is, uh, is, so, is so important. Um, and along the way, look, I think we do need to be learning the lessons that we have from these states that do have these laws so that we get better at it. Uh, and so we do put in, whether it's proper guardrails or give proper tools so that equity is at you know the the centerpiece um we at the 50th anniversary of title nine we don't want to be taking steps backward and i think that there's a way for us to do that jill what's next for for title nine in this or for uh, name image and likeness what are, what are we going to see develop here any predictions a federal national bill i hope um we we need it it's um you know to congressman's great points five years ago an athlete was like, I get a full ride from institution A and a full ride from institution B. And that's what I'm comparing. Now we have cost of attendance, which can vary from 1,395 a year to 6,000 a year. If you're a football player at five years, that's a $30,000 cash, right? Your cost of attendance. 
I, I know most people in college athletics don't understand cost of attendance, much less a prospective student athlete. Now we have the Alston money up to $5,980 a year, plus an unlimited gift suite of educational related benefits. Um, again, all good. I'm not whining, but I'm just emphasizing the Congresswoman's great point that um, you know, there's, you're no longer just scholarship from A to B and then it's NIL and then it's, we, you know, what's the, you know, you got the transfer portal coming in at the exact same time as NIL. So now we have a, not only a recruiting, but a retention issue. And it's really, really complex. I would say having only been at two institutions, the individuals who don't want our opinion are football and basketball student athletes. They have their own representation. They have their own people. They don't believe that institutions have their best interests because they assume we want them to stay uh, at our institution. Um, and so we have had the hardest time educating football and basketball athletes. Um, they are, because they have people, they've got their people. Um, and as institutions, we're working more closely with our field hockey who, you know, consistent with the statistics you shared with us, Tim, you know, we have about 56 deals out of 480 athletes. Um, it's slightly skewed toward men, but not much. Our field hockey athletes are doing the best because we're top 10 in the country. Um, so our, ours are really consistent with that. So what's next? I think federal, I think we got to figure out the international student athlete piece. My goodness, we've left them hanging. And um, you've got, you could talk to five people and some will say they absolutely can't take a single dollar or they'll be deported. And you'll have some people say, ah, that's conservative. They can take money. Um, and you'll have some people saying they can take money from their home country, but not a U.S. employer. So um, so that's that's not fair to our to our international student athletes. We have 49 of them and they're completely in limbo. Uh, so I think we have to have some resolution there. Um, you know, I think we need to what, what we've you know, we, we have to continue to focus on is protecting our athletes. Like I know the NCAA and college athletics has major problems, but let's not kid ourselves. The market's now open to people who want to do what make money off the backs of student athletes. I mean, this is why I hear from over 700 vendors wanting my business um, to get in the NIL space. They want to make money. And, um, and so we need to try and ferret out for our student athletes, who knows what they're doing and who doesn't, um, educate them on what's a bad contract and what isn't. And so we're just going to continue to double down to the extent they listen. We've got all sorts of you know, with my lawyer background, we've got tax briefings, financial aid briefings, um, you know, FTC briefings, like, hey, guys, remember, if you're going to say you use liquid IV, you have to use liquid IV. And don't forget, the NCA bans a lot of ingestibles. So don't be taking banned substances that you're, you know, I mean, all these kind of things that we're just continuing to put our heads down and, uh, and educate our student athletes best we can. Absolutely. So much left to shake out with name, image, and likeness. I want to move on because we're short on time because we mentioned that we're going to talk about women's basketball, gender equity issues, um, and what that says about the you know college sports in general. And so on that note, last year, we know Sedona Prince highlighted a variety of discrepancies with respect to the resources and amenities made available to, to men versus women competing in the NCAA basketball championships. NCAA moved for an external gender equity review, which came up with a, a number of findings and recommendations, which I won't go through. I wanted to mention a few of them, but essentially, and I think we all know this, that there's huge discrepancies with respect to the resources, the marketing, the funding, um, the broadcast contracts, uh, even the use of the term March Madness. And that has, has since shifted a bit for this current uh, tournament that, that we just finished. Ratings and uh, attendance, I believe, are at record levels for women's basketball. Um, but in terms of, you know, what we saw with those discrepancies, which, you know, some might say, well, how, why do we need a, a social media, you know, viral video to highlight what's going on in order to create change. And uh, I, I mean, I would agree. And unfortunately, it seems like shaming is sometimes the only way to get people to act. But that's what happened here, at least that started to happen. Jayla, I actually want to start with you on this, just in terms of your, you know, you're close with some current basketball athletes who are well aware of, of these disparities before this public shaming. You've noticed discrepancies between men and women in, your, in, in sports other than basketball and during your own time as a college athlete. What, what did you see? Um, as a result of this and what did you hear from what are your impressions and what did you hear from others that are um, current college athletes yeah so you know, having been out a, a couple of years it's it's been tremendous I mean to see the progress I was also on that diversity equity um, review as well 
we, as in the world, and it started with student athletes, like you said, like shined a light on something that we all knew was there, but didn't want to act on apparently. And all of a sudden, you know, women's basketball can be a part of March Madness, can start shattering all of these numbers. And they always have, they always do. And we see the same thing with all women's sports. Volleyball had record numbers this last year. Um, so, you know, for me, I think it's just time for the leaders in the space to recognize the trajectory of some of their programs and put their money where their mouth is at the end of the day, supporting these athletes um, the same way that we do other programs. I, you know, as a former athlete who we had our ups and downs um, on the court, but, you know, it's also difficult when we do have a great season and you see that another sport gets a new locker room and a new game studio um, that hasn't had a great season. So it's just some of those small things that female student athletes recognize and sometimes internalize. And it's in some ways hurtful, but, you know, you have to be grateful for the people that are stepping up and stepping out to speak out on it because that's the only way that change is going to happen. So, Congresswoman Trahan, why do you think we've seen why do we still see these glaring failures in terms of gender equity in college sports? And what can we do besides yeah. the public shaming? Yeah, look, we all saw, we were all read the USA Today uh, report uh, just a week ago, highlighting that schools spent um, just over twice as much on men than women on travel, equipment, uh, and recruiting combined. That's $1.16 billion compared to $576 million. And in 2021, that's appalling. Um, I Think that there's still an attitude, really an underlying assumption that women's sports are not popular and therefore can't generate revenue. And in reality, it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, despite these egregious underinvestments compared to their male counterparts, women's college sports have vastly overperformed viewership expectations. You know, I don't know, the past few couple of years, right? And the emergence of NIL, I think, is only going to help that. But that just goes to show the need to require uh, more equal investment across the board in both women's and men's sports, promotion, equipment, uh, just across the board so much more. And I think to do that, we really have to seriously start enforcing uh, Title IX. Experts predict that over 800 of the 1,085 institutions governed by the NCAA are probably out of compliance. And we need more leaders within colleges and the athletic associations to prioritize compliance and the Office of you know, Civil Rights at the Department of Education, they need to have more capacity so that they can focus on the range of Title IX violations. But you know, we also need more reporting and transparency into how institutions are meeting proportionality. Uh, are they using loopholes like including male practice players in their total women athlete numbers? You know, my, I've got a lot of colleagues on the Education and Labor Committee who are looking into these issues. Uh, um, additionally, you know, I've got colleagues like uh, Carolyn Maloney uh, from New York, Jackie Spear, uh, California, Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey. They recently introduced the, scholars, uh, the College Sports Commission Act, I think is what it's called, which would, it, it would establish a 16 member um, uh, commission, congressional uh, commission to comprehensively study gender equity in NCAA's operation of tournaments and other programs. Uh, for which there are you know, men and women's divisions. And so I think that that commission will present a final report with policy recommendations um, that the NCAA should adopt to promote equity between men's and women's programs and, uh, and reforms Congress could consider even uh, to improve oversight of gender equity at NCAA. So I guess when we've all started this in terms of the celebration of the 50 years, but a recognition that we have a long way to go, uh, I think we all should be leaning into that, uh, including, you know, including the Congress, if there's a role for us to play. Jill, you oversaw women's basketball at, uh, at Notre Dame with a lot of success. And I'm curious what your, your reactions were to uh, not only last year's calling out of the NCAA's discrepancies with respect to women's basketball, but also uh, what's happened since then in terms of the changes that happened for this, this year's tournament and whether you know, positive stuff is continuing to happen in that respect, are we moving in the right direction? Yeah, we are. But as both my colleagues have noted, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, guess what happened when we invested in women's basketball at Notre Dame? Six Final Fours in nine years, right? Investment matters. And so 
what we're seeing, I hate to be a two level person again, but what we're seeing with respect to gender equity is um, the easy fix level, which was March Madness, social media, 68 teams, corporate activation. Um, what has not yet happened is the media deal, which then will lead to revenue distribution. And, you know, it's pretty simple stuff. You have to incentivize schools to invest. And if there's an academic or a, a women's basketball distribution unit hanging out there, people will invest. And I couldn't agree more on transparency. Um, I think there are some little known differences that do result in different expenditures. For example, guarantee games. I mean, people are paying 2 million in football for guarantee games, 150 to 200,000 in men's basketball. And in women's basketball, the market's more like 30,000. So if you're gonna pay five guarantee games, um, that's you know 500,000 or more in men's hoops that the women just aren't spending because the market's not there. Um, so I think there are, it, it's easy to say there's 1.3 billion dollars in difference, but to really dig into the numbers, I can tell you it costs a lot more to run a game with 5,000 fans than it does 750 fans. You got to pay the police, you got to pay CSC security, you got to, it's just far different expenditures. So I wish we had more than 750 fans for our women's game. Um, but then it comes back to, you know, like I, I get a big kick out of how everyone raked us over the coals and we deserve it. Um, from NCAA tournament uh, to institutions to conferences, we have to be a lot better. But let's not forget that our society is rampant with sexism. I mean, my favorite athletic uh, news I receive, I looked at the top page today, there were 56 articles, six involved women. And you had to get to the 28th article to find one that involved women. The others came at the 42nd, 43rd, 51st, 52nd, and 53rd. And guess what? All six articles written by the same author. So my favorite publication has assigned one woman to be our token women sports writer. And then she rakes us over the coals for our inequity. And it's like, we all need to look in the freaking mirror because this is not going to be better. If the media doesn't get better, we're celebrating women's hoops viewership this year. It was awesome. It was 11% of the men's. Like we just have a long, long, long way to go. And if we all don't look at the mirror, if we just want to say NCA all your fault, we're not gonna get any better. This starts with the media, corporate sponsors, institutions, conferences. It is so deep seated in our country um, that this is not an easy fix. And I am not one to shy away from the fact that we in college athletics have screwed up, but I also want everyone to know it's gonna take a village to make this better um, because it is systemic in our society and it's really, really disappointing. Congresswoman with your hand, uh, final thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that, uh, look, it, it, first of all, my final thought, it's been such a privilege and an honor uh, to hear such strong women voices uh, in women's sports uh, with Jill and Jayla. So Tim, thank you for, for convening us. I think Jill probably put the best punctuation uh, on this conversation. Uh, so much of what we're uh, trying to weed whack through in Title IX and women's sports is systemic uh, across our society. I show up to work every day in the U.S. House of Representatives, and there still aren't enough women serving. Uh, you know, but I I have to take hope uh, wherever I can find it. You know, yesterday we uh, we confirmed um, as Supreme Court Justice uh, Justice uh, Brown Jackson, uh, and so I do believe that um, we all have to lean into how we're going to change and frankly, accelerate uh, all these obstacles that are in the way uh, of women. You know, one of the things that we didn't really get to, to, to touch on, uh, but the other piece of, you know, legislation that we've introduced was the College Athlete Right to Organize Act, because at the end of the day, we want to give athletes more power. Uh, we want to make sure that there is this ability to collectively bargain for conditions for fairness uh, while they're playing this sport and give them the voice that they, they deserve. Uh, and so I'm hopeful um, for the future because we are having these conversations. We are electing more women to Congress. We have a whole new generation of women athletes who are becoming social influencers. And that is a democratized platform rather than the big media that we're seeing. And hopefully that just nudges. Uh, it nudges the big money players along in terms of what's, what's possible. So um, I uh, thank you again for inviting me. I always learn a ton when I, uh, I sit with women who are in the thick of it um, and it really does inform what I, what I work on here. So thank you. Kayla. 
any final thoughts? I have to say, I echo the same. I think, like Laurie said, you guys both put the punctuation on it. Um, just very eager to see how this space evolves and excited that we have strong women at the forefront of it um, to really just empower young ladies and marginalized groups in this space. So very excited and appreciative to be here. Yeah, I, I'd say the same. I mean, it's a it's a honor for me to speak with each of you, and I know we've we've all had a, conversations in a variety of uh, topics in the past. And I really appreciate not only your insights and the things that you've uh, shared with me that contribute to to my knowledge and success, but also uh, your leadership. And it's very clear in terms of what you've conveyed today that um, you're passionate about it you are in the thick of it and you're taking action to uh to help we didn't get to we only have a couple minutes left and i was hoping to to get to some questions from the audience but um i think we have to wind up here on note uh one of the comments from uh, donna lapiano she she mentioned that title nine must be enforced to realize the promise of sports regardless of race gender socioeconomic status and otherwise through our public education system not just with respect to our, our major sports of, of football and, and basketball. Uh, it's a great point. Thank you all for uh, your comments and sharing your perspectives today. Thank you for the audience for tuning in. As a reminder for the Sports Lawyers Association, there is our annual conference uh, March 12th through 14th in Atlanta this year visit the website to register. There'll be more discussions about name, image, and likeness, hot topics in college sports, and including uh, transgender issues in college sports, which we didn't, we didn't get to today. But thank you all so much, and I'll end it there. Take care. I have, thanks so much, Tim, and it was really awesome to serve on a panel with you too. Thank you, keep up the great work. Yes, you too, Jill. Thank you. Bye, Jayla. Take care. Bye, ladies. Thank Catch you. up soon, Jayla. Bye.